Let's pray, and we will, we will get into God's word. We're going to pray from Psalm 139. It says uh, at the end of the chapter, verse 23, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my concerns. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, we, we know from this psalm that you understand our thoughts from far away. You observe our travels and, and you see our rest and you're aware of all of our ways. So this, this verse is kind of a repetitive and a no-duh statement, knowing that you, you already know our hearts, you already know our minds, you know our emotions, you know what we brought in here this morning. And we're thankful for that, but we're also we're needing you to engage with us on that, Father, because we are so weak, we are so frail, and and you are so great, and so we are asking that you take the truth of your word, and you fill us up with that, and you sanctify us and change us, so that we do not stay the same, but instead that you lead us in that everlasting way, you lead us in the path of righteousness, you lead us in, in, in the truth so that we can be free and so that we can glorify you. Father, we, we are not here simply to get a lesson. We are not here simply as a social club. Father, we want to be in your presence. We want to be changed by you because this world desperately needs that. And we desperately need that. And so we are pleading with you, God, as, as our loving Savior, that you would not leave us in our, 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 our spot of apathy if, we're, if we are in this spot, you would not leave us in this place of, of being deceived by doctrines of demons, God, but that you would root that out and replace it with truth. And God, ultimately, this morning, we don't want to hear the words of a preacher or for, of a pastor. We want to hear your words so that we can see Jesus clearly and only and lifted up this morning. So, Father, please rip away all those things so that those things can take place. God, it can only happen because of you. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Hosea chapter 14, you can turn over there in your Bibles to Hosea chapter 14. I would encourage you to go over there and also take some notes because I've got a lot of cross-references today, so you can go back and and fact-check me, as uh, Basil was saying, that make sure that I'm not off off my rocker here. But before we do any of that, I would like to play a game with you guys. I would like to play the game, Would You Rather? You guys like that game? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to give you some would you rather, and you guys have to vote which one would you prefer. Would you rather be poor and live a peaceful life, or would you rather have millions of dollars and have a lot of drama in your life? Poor and peace. Poor and peace? Poor. Rich and drama. What did you say? Poor with a rich friend. Yeah, poor with a rich We just need one person to say the rich thing, and then we're all set. I'm thinking about it. You're thinking about it. All right, number two. Would you rather always say what you're thinking or never be able to speak again? Always say what I'm thinking. <laughs> you're living the life. <laughs> yeah. No filter or the extreme filter. What, uh, another one. Would you rather talk like Yoda or breathe like Darth Vader? <laughs> Darth Vader. Like Yoda. Darth, yeah, we always hear Scotty coming. All right, last one. Last one. <laughs> Would you rather accept God's revelation as truth or reject God? Well, we're in church. So you have to say, I'm just kidding. I just don't want eternal damnation. I, 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 I want you to think about this. The entire Bible, you look at the entire Bible, and I would submit to you in the very simplicity of what the Bible does is that the Bible is a would you rather question. That God reveals himself puts himself on display and then says, would you rather have me or would you rather reject me? What would you rather have? Again, I think it's from the very beginning in in scripture all the way to the very end. Here are some, uh, some, some examples of that. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. He's giving the, the law again. And he's saying at the very end of the law, he's saying, Hey, will you choose life? Or will you choose death? Will you choose to obey? Or will you choose disobedience? Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. We see this in houses plastered all over the place. But the idea of it is that, hey, you can choose to serve the Amorite gods and all the gods that you're going to see throughout the land that I'm giving to you. Or you can choose to serve me. And he says at the very end of that, choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, 
I will serve the Lord. Psalm chapter 1 gives that example of, of you've got the path of, of the sinner and the mocker, and then you've got the path of the righteous, the person who walks according to God's word. Then you go to Jesus, and Jesus is one of Jesus' favorite phrases of, of all time, I would believe, would be, those who have ears to hear, let them listen. It's in Matthew, it's in Mark, it's in Luke over and over again, it's in Revelation. If you want all the references to it, in total, there are about a dozen times that Jesus just says, if you have ears, you're going to listen. If you don't have ears, you're not going to listen. There is a choice before us. Matthew chapter 7, at the end of the Beatitudes, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, what does he say? He says, you can either build your house on the rock or you can build your house on the sand. All of these examples throughout Scripture. Hosea chapter 14, verse 9. I want to read it in uh, multiple translations just so you guys kind of get to soak in it because we only have one verse today, so we're going to just we're gonna milk it. We're going to go into it as much as we can. So New, uh, New King James Version, it says, Who is wise? Let him understand these things. Who is prudent? Let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. Again, it's a choice. ESV. Here's what it says. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the upright walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. New American Standard Version says, Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the righteous will walk in them but the transgressors will stumble in them. The Christian Standard Version is what we're using today, and, and this is what it says kind of broken down. I want you to kind of get the, the idea of this entire verse in, in one big shot. Here's what it says. It says, let whoever is wise. That idea of wise is to be skilled in something. You have Solomon's uh, men who are building the temple, and they were wise men because they were skilled, and, and they were craftsmen who were able to, to use their uh, knowledge and apply it in a very beautiful and artistic way. It is wisdom that is used as a skill. Understand or discern could be the, the word that's translated there. Understand these things and whoever is insightful, discerning. Those words are the same. So he's saying, hey, whoever is wise, discern these things. Whoever is discerning, recognize or know them, yada. It's the idea, again, of intimately knowing. And there's this whole kind of rabbit or a chain link fence kind of thing that's happening here. Wisdom leads to discernment. Discernment then leads to knowing. And then knowing leads to, for the ways of the Lord are right, meaning upright or smooth or straight, that God's way, his path, is something that is perfect. It is something that there is no resistance to it. Whatever God does, it is the right thing. And the righteous, who are just, who are upright, who are innocent, who are in the right, are going to walk in them. So if you're wise, you're going to be discerning, you're going to know, and then when you know, you're going to walk in those right paths of the Lord. Or the other option, but the rebellious, the transgressor, the one who branches out, will stumble in them. What Hosea does here at the very end of the, the whole message that he gives is he says, hey, I've given you 14 chapters of information. At the very end here, if you understand what I just said, you are going to respond. You are going to obey. And that is today's kind of main thought, is that if you understand Hosea's message, then you will obey God. If you read through Hosea and you're like, not a big deal, then you've missed the point. And for Israel, at this point, they are, are bearing down on the end of this, this life cycle before Assyria comes in, and they're at this point where they have very little time before they have to make a decision of will we obey or will we disobey? And Hosea presents them and says, what are you going to do? I believe that for us, we will obey if you understand these three pieces of information that are given here in this verse. The first one is that the Lord is always right. The Lord is absolutely always right and he's always right because his knowledge is perfect. When you look at the, the history of Israel, Israel was chosen from the beginning with Abraham and all the way through, and they were God's chosen people. 
Hosea chapter 9, verse 10. I would encourage you to flip over there. I don't have these on the screen because I want you to kind of be able to think through these. And Cindy, as we're going through these, uh, anything that is up on the screen, I would love it if Hosea 14, 9 can just kind of stick there. So if you have it, this version or the other version is fine. I just, any, in, any uh, filler time, I'd love you to just have it, have it up there. Thank you. The Lord is always right. Hosea 9, verse 10. Hosea chapter 9, verse 10. He says, I discovered Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your ancestors like the first fruit of the fig tree in its first season. God had chosen Israel. In Deuteronomy 7, it says, I didn't choose them because of their, their nature and how great they were. I chose them because of grace. I chose them because I chose to love them. Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, it says, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. God's knowledge is perfect, and he goes back and he looks at the nation of Israel and says, I love these people because I've chosen them. I've chosen them because I have loved them. But in Hosea, the whole theme of this has been Israel the harlot, the promiscuous people. In Hosea chapter 1, verse 2, at the very beginning, when the Lord first spoke to Hosea, he said this to him, Go and marry a woman of promiscuity and have children of promiscuity, for the land is committing blatant acts of promiscuity by abandoning the Lord. Again, the, the illustration that's kind of been in our minds throughout this has been Braveheart, where Braveheart has the row of soldiers, and they basically, before the battle, turn their backsides to the other people, and they moon them because they say, hey, we think nothing of you. And that's exactly what God is, is describing with the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel has turned their backsides, abandoned, and abandoned the Lord. Hosea chapter 5, verse 4 says, Their actions do not allow them to return to their God, for a spirit of promiscuity is among them, and they do not know the Lord. Hosea chapter 9, verse 1 says, Israel, do not rejoice jubilantly as the nations do, for you have acted promiscuous, uh, promiscuously, leaving your God. You love the wages of a prostitute on every grain threshing floor. God knows them from the beginning. God saw them and knew them in their sin. Nothing was hidden from his sight, and yet Israel will be restored. We see this complete knowledge of God that even as, this Hosea, as Hosea is giving this message of judgment, he's saying there will be a future for them. In Hosea chapter 2, verse 19 and 20, we looked at this and it says, I will take you to be my wife forever. Future tense. I will take you to be my wife forever. I will take you to be my wife in righteousness, justice, love, and compassion. I will take you to be my wife in faithfulness, and you will know the Lord. Hosea 2.23, I will sow her in the land for myself, and I will have compassion on Lo Rohama. I will, I will say to Lo Ami, you are my people, and he will say, you are my God. There is restoration that will take place between God and his chosen people, Israel. Hosea chapter 6, verse 1, Come, let's return to the Lord, for he has torn us, and he will heal us. He has wounded us, and he will bind up our wounds. God's knowledge of the situation is perfect. He sees what Israel is going through. He sees the rebellion, and yet he still has a plan for them. And God is right. His paths are right because God's behavior is perfect. If you remember the serious goal of Hosea, it was simply that we are to live in adoration of God's amazing, unchanging, faithful love, and yet be in reverential awe of his judgment that love and justice were happening at the same time to the nation of Israel. And this was true for them at this time, that God presents and says, I love you, Israel, but I'm also going to judge you, Israel. God is right because God's expectation of his people is absolutely perfect. He demands their salvation throughout the book. Hey, this is not an optional thing, but you need to repent. You must turn to me. You must return to the Lord. Israel needed to and must be saved from God's wrath, and he demands their obedience. God is right, according to this verse, and he has every right to demand obedience. And in that, if you disagree, you need to go back and read Hosea chapter 9. Let whoever is wise, whoever is discerning, whoever is discerning to know there is a reality that if you miss the wisdom part, then you're going to end up at a spot 
where you are going to disagree, you are going to, to not want to have anything to do with God ha what God has said, and you are going to be foolish, which is the opposite of wisdom, right? You're going to be dumb. You're going to be gullible. You're going to go the wrong direction. Israel's foundational problem and their foundational thing that they're going through right now, which is, is awful because you read through Hosea and you see that their, their wives, their children are going to be brutally murdered by Assyria. They are going to come and, and just ravage the land. And their one problem that they had, they just disagreed with God. God said this, and they're like, nah, I don't want that. And as a result, think about the destruction that takes place. 721 B.C. happens, and, and Assyria comes in. And, and I think of, not to make light of it, but I think of the Pirates of the Caribbean. The Pirates of the Caribbean has this line that's quoted over and over again, and it says that they're more like guidelines than actual rules. And this is what Israel has done, is that they looked at God's word, and Hosea says, here's what you must do. And they're like, well, it's more like guidelines. And as a result of them treating God's word that way, and when we treat God's word as anything less than authoritative, our lives are in the crosshairs of destruction. The Lord is always right. If you understand that, you will obey. And if you understand this, that the righteous walk in the Lord's ways, you will also obey. Two things. Righteousness is imputed and righteousness is practiced. Righteousness imputed. God alone is righteous. We've got to understand this. God alone is righteous. In Romans chapter 3, verse 10, it says, As it is written, there is how many righteous? There is no one righteous. 3, verse 10, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. Isaiah 64, 6 even goes one step further and says, Hey, any of your righteous deeds, all the good things that you do, are like filthy rags. Yeah, no, it's, it's that kind of a thing. And we just don't have the ability to promote or to do anything righteous. And humanity, though, in our state of not being able to be righteous, can be justified, can be declared righteous. And that's where we see Romans chapter 3, 24 through 26. It says, for, uh, yeah, 23 through 26, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented him as the mercy seat by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. God presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and justify the one who has faith in Jesus. The believer has righteousness imputed to them. The idea of imputed, uh, Basil, can I get your help? I'm going to pick on you. Can you come up here? Here's my jacket. And you can tell that it's my jacket because it's got my name on it. If this is my jacket and I put it on, you don't have to wear this very long because it's stinking hot. Don't run away with it. Your muscles are just too big for it. <laughs> okay. Right now, my jacket has been imputed onto Basil because it's mine. I, I turn around. It's got my name on it. That's how I can tell all of my clothes because I've got that sticky thing on all, everything I wear. Yep. It's imputed because it's mine and I have given it to Basil. Now, Basil can choose to do whatever he wants because he has it, but... He has it. He can run out the door and I'll never see my jacket again. But he has it because it's imputed upon him. Romans chapter 3, 24, uh, 23 through 26. Could you throw that up there? Justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus through faith. When we put our faith in Jesus, that he died to forgive our sins, that he rose again and gave us eternal life, we have been imputed, we have been given righteousness. Thank you. You can take that off. You can sweat it out. Am now. I taking off righteousness right now? Well, no, it's just my jacket. Okay. <laughs> There's got to be an end to my illustration at some point. So, <laughs> Think about that, though. If you've believed in Jesus, you have been given Jesus' righteousness. Now think about who Jesus is. 
Think about it. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 says that it is Jesus who is the one who possesses the entire fullness of God's nature. The entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. We cannot summarize this in words. The righteousness that you possess because of what Jesus has done is God himself on us. The glory of God, the majesty of God, the grace of God, the goodness of God, all the characteristics that you could ever imagine, that is what is being given to us. Let me ask you this question. How was Israel given the opportunity to have God's righteousness imputed on them in Hosea before Jesus was even around? This isn't rhetorical. This is for you guys to, to answer. How, how could they, because in, in Hosea chapter 14, verse 9, it says, uh, for the, Lord is, the, the ways of the Lord are right and the righteous walk in them. How can they be considered righteous if Jesus hasn't even died yet and they haven't had the opportunity to have the righteousness imputed upon them? How can Israel have how can Israel be described as righteous if Jesus hasn't died yet? Because at Hosea, it's before Jesus came on the scene and before Jesus died. What did you say? Sorry, say it a little louder. By obeying God? Okay. Repenting? Okay. By faith. We've got three votes out there. By promise? What do you mean by promise? Um, walking by faith in the way that uh, they know that if they follow God's rules. Okay, yeah. No, I, I'm not going to put you on the spot too much, but yeah. 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 No, you're good. Any other thoughts? In Galatians chapter 3, verse 6 and verse 11, there are two verses that answer this question. How did, how did Hosea have the opportunity to tell the people of Israel before Jesus was even around that you can be righteous? Number one, just like Abraham, the first Jewish person, just like Abraham, who believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. What does that mean? Well, verse 11 says, now it is clear Clear is a key word here. It is clear that no one is justified before God by the law. In other words, you cannot be justified by obedience because the righteous will live by what? Faith. By faith. From the time of Abraham to the time of Hosea to the time of Jesus to the time of now, the only reason and the only way that anyone can be righteous and have righteousness imputed upon them is because of faith. Now, here's the reality, is that you can have righteousness imputed upon you, but then there must be a righteousness that is practiced. Because being imputed is a very passive thing. It is, I have faith, and so righteousness is given to me. But he says in uh, Hosea chapter 14, verse 9, it says that the righteous walk in them. So there's an imputation that takes place, but there's also a practicing that takes place because it is a both and. It's like if you had a pass or a ticket let's say, to Israel, and you've got that ticket, and you say, okay, that's a nice ticket. I have to get on the plane to be able to go there. If I have a, a really nice box set of knives, and I'm like, man, I'm excited to use these knives, but I leave them in the box, well, good have they done. It is all sorts of things. If I have a Taylor guitar, the nicest kind of guitar you can get, and I don't ever play it, what good is it? It's not being practiced. Go back to Romans chapter 3 verse 24 or 23 through 26 and the key word there is demonstrate that Jesus was demonstrating his righteousness that Jesus was demonstrating his righteousness to us that it was on display that there was a practicing that took place because in Hosea chapter 14 verse 9 it says that the righteous walk in them in fact it's in motion it's in obedience that righteousness then is demonstrated because I would submit to you that righteousness that is impossible to see is an impossible thing in itself. It is impossible to have righteousness that is not seen in some way. Righteousness is on display, it's an oxymoron. If I say, hey, act natural, it's impossible. If I say, hey, uh, just have the controlled chaos, 
it is an oxymoron. If I say plastic glasses, it's an opposite thing. And yet here what we see is that with righteousness, it is an impossible thing to have righteousness without there being some sort of acting upon it or walking in it as well. James chapter 4, verse 17, I think makes this point. It says, so it is sin to know the good and yet not do it. Righteousness is knowing the good thing to do and then doing it. What was that verse? James 4, 17. Okay. Yeah, James 4, 17. So how would Hosea know if his message made an impact? He, he gives this message for decades, literally decades before the, the Assyrian invasion comes upon, uh, comes upon them. How do we know that it makes an impact? The only way that he knows that it makes an impact is that Israel would recognize the truth and then they would act on the truth and obey it. For us, the same way. How would anybody know that you are a believer? That you would believe the truth, you would recognize the truth, and then you would act on it. Romans chapter 10, verse 10 says that one believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. But at the same time that it's imputed, it must be practiced. Righteousness, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 29, says if you know that he is righteous, that God is righteous, you know this as well. Everyone who does what is right has been born of him. There is a connection in our lives. We cannot disconnect it that when we are saved, there should be a response of righteous living and righteous behavior as well. It must be practiced. Last thing as we close today is that you will obey if you understand the other side of this, which is the rebellious stumble in the Lord's right way, the rebellious stumble in the Lord's way. First of all, we see the word rebellious, and the word could be translated transgressor, but it literally means to branch out. It means to take something that is, is kind of orthodox and say, hey, I'm going to change this or pervert it in some way. Israel was told over and over again, know God, know the right way, obey God, do these things. But instead, Israel branched out from God's word. Hosea 4.1 says, there is no truth, no faithful love, and no knowledge of God in the land. That is a, a harsh criticism of the people of Israel. They were supposed to know, but they branched out from it. It'd be like taking creative liberties with the Mona, Mona Lisa. Here's a picture of all the Mona Lisas that you can find on the internet. You know what Mona Lisa is supposed to be, and somebody has taken Mona Lisa and said, hey, we're going to improve upon it. We are going to change it. We are going to add or take away. Here's what has happened with Israel and God's word. Israel added to it. Israel took away from it. Israel usurped it and said, we're not going to take this as the authority. We'll take this instead. Israel just ignored it altogether. They did whatever they wanted because they said, hey, we are going to branch out from what God's right way has said. And as a result, they stumbled. It says that they stumbled. The, the literal idea of this is that you have weak legs, and, and specifically in your ankles. The idea is that the ankles, they cause them to fall. Has anyone ever tripped or fallen over anything? I, I, I kicked my dishwasher yesterday, and I wanted to fall down so bad, and it hurt so bad. Because you just you know what happens when, when you're going to go down. I have this, uh, this gif of Messi just breaking somebody's ankles, and I think it's hilarious. He falls down. He's gone. Because he has weak ankles, weak guy, he's on the ground. This is what Hosea is describing in chapter 14, verse 9, is that the, the, the rebellious, the ones who have branched out, will fall. Israel's support was destroyed. Their political independence, taken away. Their freedom of worship, taken away. Their comfort and ease, taken away. Their family and friends, literally taken away. And all the while, Israel is like, oh, my ankles are strong. It's fine. Uh, I've, got, I've got the ability to ignore Hosea, and I don't have to listen to him, so I'm okay. I'm going to ignore because I'm, I'm comfortable, I'm proud, and I don't have to have intimacy with God. So like, they, I can just avoid that stuff. I can be okay over here. And Hosea is saying, no, you're going to stumble 
and fall and be broken as a result. And we know the end of the story. We have hindsight on our side where we can look at 721 BC and we can see that Assyria came in, they, they wiped out the northern kingdom of Israel, they spread them out all over the world, and they broke Israel's ankles for good. Think about this. Why, why are Jewish people found all over the globe? Why, why aren't they just in the Middle East? Why do we find them in Europe during, during World War II? Why do we find them in Africa? Why do we find Jewish people in North America? I mean, not a whole lot of other countries have that story. And why is it the case? Because, because Hosea gave a message, it was ignored, and God judged them. We have physical proof that God deals with these things very seriously. All because Israel branched out from God's word and it broke them. That should be an application for us. I'm going to push on this for, as, we, as we close. The big idea today simply is that despite God's faithful love, that generation of Jewish people experienced God's full judgment. Despite God's faithful love, that generation of Jews experienced God's full judgment. Yes, there is hope for the, the nation of Israel. Yes, there are promises that are yet to be fulfilled and that are being fulfilled to the nation of Israel today. But Hosea wasn't speaking to Israel of 2024. He wasn't speaking to Jewish people today. He was speaking to that generation at that time. And as he spoke to them in the 700s, they ignored the warning to repent. They ignored the warning to believe. They ignored the warning to obey. And I am fearful. As I read through this, I'm like, man, this is eerily similar to what's happening in the church at large today. And I am fearful, not just as the church at large, because it's really easy for us to be like, man, that church down the street, they are the worst. It hurts. They are the worst. <laughs> but we need to understand, and I am fearful as, as your pastor and as your friend, that we are headed down the same path as well as a church. And so I want to give you two points of application, and, and these aren't going to be comfortable things, but I want to try to push on these a little bit. The first one is, just a second, Cindy. That's okay. The first one is, notice who is missing from our church. I want you to almost visibly like turn your head and, and, and rotate. There are people who do not show up to our church anymore because they have disagreed and they have branched out from God's word. Because they said, you know, that, that's not, not for me. And I want us to understand that if it can happen to people around us in this room, it can happen to you. We are not immune. And so this next step is something where I don't want you to think about those people or that person or my spouse that's over there. Like I, I want you to think about you and try to apply this as personally and as individually as you can. I want you to do a self-inventory. Inventories happen at stores because they want to make sure that they don't lose product and that the, the, the store is healthy and that they're going in the right direction. They do inventory from time to time because they realize it's, it's critical to the health of the store. You need to do, and I need to do some self-inventory here today. Number one, when you, and I will put in if you, open the Bible, are you applying and aligning to it? Or are you ignoring and generalizing it so you can feel comfortable? This is the mark of somebody who is either stumbling or about to stumble or the person who is walking in righteousness, is a person who takes God's word seriously and says, I am going to align my life in accordance with it. Secondly, the question is simply, are you righteous, imputed and practicing? Have you put your faith in Jesus as your Savior? Have you receive that righteousness that can only come because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross and by rising again? And then, am I practicing it? And this is critical because the Jewish people could have easily said, well, of course I'm, I'm righteous because I'm a Jewish person. Of course I'm a Christian because I'm here at the church. Because, And you kind of just follow that argument all the way down. But I want you to, to push back against that in your own life and realize we as believers should be living absolutely opposite and contrary to the rest of the world. We should not be blending in. 
And so I'm going to read something that I wrote, and it's nothing magical, but I want it to be something where you maybe grit your teeth a little bit and realize, is this me? Where the world says debt, you yell freedom. Where the world says hate and fear because of all the things that are happening in our world today, you say, no, I have hope and forgiveness. The world says gossip, but you speak gratitude. The world says divorce, but you live faithfully. The world says addiction and indulge, but you live controlled. The world says stress, anxiety, depression, terrible mental health, but you sing praise and you have joy. The world says chaos, but you have peace. I'll ask you a question again. Is your life righteous? Because I will, I will submit to you that if your life looks and feels more like the world column that I just read to you, do you understand the danger that you're in? Do you understand the danger you are in? Hosea had just spent 14 chapters trying to convince the people of Israel to say, hey, you're going the wrong way. And we easily can be like, yeah, man, they were the worst. We are the worst. <laughs> we are the ones that are prone to do this. Do we understand the danger we're in, where we are in? Don't stay where we're at. Don't become apathetic. Don't settle in. And so here are my three points of application as we close. Ask for help. Just ask for help. If you're like, man, this is where my life is going, ask for help. Find somebody who loves you but is going to speak the truth to you and give them the permission to do that. Say, hey, man, I just feel like this is where I'm going and give them an open door into your life. Ask for the help and wisdom that they can offer Ask the Lord for help and wisdom. Do not do this alone and feel like I can just do it. Secondly, admit God's word is the answer. It's not a self-help. It's not a talk to Matt and he'll fix your life in three easy steps. It's God's word has the answer. And thirdly, abide with God to produce righteousness. The last thing I want to do as we leave here is be like, you guys do X, Y, and Z and you, you're good Christians. That's not the case. Righteousness happens. Think about the illustration in John 15. Righteousness happens when the branches, when the, the vine is healthy and the branch is just plugged in. Fruit comes, righteousness will come. You must abide. That is our responsibility. And that's where righteousness comes from. It is not, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull myself up and I'm going to fix myself. Today, we have to understand in the same way that Hosea was pleading with the nation of Israel, we have to understand that we must obey. We must respond with obedience to God's faithful and changing love and the fact that judgment will come on those who disobey. Let's pray. Father, we know your word is true. We know it's trustworthy. And I'm praying over our church. I'm praying over our people and the people represented here of, of other churches too, God, that, that we would be a, a people and, and a people of believers who, who are not resting and apathetic toward what your word says, but that we are engaged and we are pursuing you with a, a love for you. God, we do not want to grow cold. We do not want to, to drift away, as it says in Hebrews. We don't want to become like the rest of the world where we have, have lost our first love. But, Father, we want to abide and be close to you. So, Father, give us a purpose and a passion this week to not settle but to strive for you. In your name we pray. Amen.